Hi, everybody. I'm really excited about today's discussion, uh, all about leadership lessons from the sports sports world. I uh, just want to say right up front, you do not need us to be a sports fan to appreciate the conversation we are about to have. The lessons learned and the takeaways here are going to be applicable for all leaders. Uh, but we have some really interesting insights from our research team here at the Center for Creative Leadership. I'm excited for my colleagues to share those with you in a second. They are drawn from both the World Cup uh, and professional hockey in particular, but we're going to touch on a few different sports here. Uh, you might actually be surprised by how much our takeaways resonate, even if you, like me, uh, stopped playing sports in high school or earlier, or maybe you never started in the first place. So to kick us off, I want to do introductions. Uh, I'm your host, Eric Ginsberg, and today I'm joined by the three colleagues you see with me on the screen, uh, who each bring a unique perspective to this topic. Um, and ex I'm excited for you to hear from each of them. I want to kick us off uh, by having them introduce themselves, starting with you, Martin, uh, the CEO and president of the Center for Creative Leadership. Martin, some people tuning in might be wondering what brought the CEO for this discussion. So uh, tell us why you're here. All right. Uh, thanks, Eric. So as Eric said, I'm Martin Schneider. I joined CCL, <coughs> excuse me, late last year as a president and CEO. Um, and my bio will tell you a little bit more about my work history with Gillette Procter & Gamble and uh, VF Corporation. But what my bio doesn't say is that I grew up playing competitive hockey until I was hurt early in my 20s, which ended my playing career. <clears throat> and if you look, you can probably tell that's a few years ago. But since that time, I've coached six and under teams and college level teams and just about everything else in between. I'm also a professional ice skating coach. But prior to joining CCL, I'll say I was happily retired, although my wife might challenge retired because I spent many hours on the ice every week working with aspiring and professional hockey players, including players from the NHL. And as I said, I joined CCL late last year and I took my first vacation a few weeks ago. what I do? I spent the week on the ice helping run a hockey camp. It was a really good, fun week for me, other than when an enthusiastic nine-year-old caught me upside the face as he was jumping over the boards, but more on that later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martin. I appreciate you sharing that. I think it's a very interesting uh, part of, of who you are as a person and love that you're able to bring that expertise and insights to the table. Um, Dave, why don't we go to you? Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, Dave Altman, I've been at CCL nearly 20 years, been on the executive team in a num number of different roles. And I'm really interested in the research underlying the work that we do with leaders and leadership teams across the globe. And some of that research we're going to be presenting to you today. Great. Thank you, Dave. And some of you, if you are a regular in our uh, live discussions here, you may recognize Andy. He participated in our most recent session. If you haven't seen it, go back and watch that in our feed. But Andy, introduce uh, yourself to those folks who don't know you. Uh, Andy, I'm sorry, you're muted. I'm still having an issue hearing Andy, unfortunately. Um, we'll come right back to you in a second um, and give you a second to try and sort that out. But one of the things that we want to talk about today uh, is the the overlap, of course, between insights from the sports world and uh you know, professional experience, regardless of the type of organization you're in. Um, for those of you who are tuning in, you know, if you are a sports fan, I'm going to give you an opportunity here to shout out your sports team. Um, regardless of the sport, you know, here's your chance to drop them in the chat. So for me, I have to mention the Carolina Tar Heels basketball and, of course, the Boston Celtics. Uh, I was telling the panelists before we got started that uh, I'm uh, originally from Massachusetts, so that's that's where a lot of my sports allegiances lie. So, um, Andy, let's let's test really quickly and see if your audio is back. Otherwise, I'll I'll jump to Dave. But um, tell us a little bit about where this research came from and and why uh, you wanted to dig into the the World Cup and the NHL.
I'm still having trouble hearing Andy, unfortunately. We were joking beforehand that uh, that Dave might have to jump in and, <laughs> and fill a Andy's shoes. Um, Dave, I'm going to put you on the spot and, and feed you some questions, let you try and maybe jump out and jump back in and see if that will let you access it. Um, we, we did test this backstage beforehand, and Andy sounded fine, but apologize for that quick technical issue there. So, Dave, um, sorry to put you on the spot. Sure. Um, but... Tell us a little bit more about why we wanted to do this research in the first place. What were we hoping to determine or, or why look at sports? Yeah, we're really we're interested in team effectiveness. And so we look at different types of teams and then try to uh, triangulate, bring together the data from different teams. So the current effort that we're going to talk about today was led by Andy and a couple of other uh, CCL colleagues. And it was focused on understanding how leaders enhance team effectiveness. And so when you dig into some of that research on teams, research that we've done and that others have done, there's some really interesting and powerful work that comes out of professional sports. And, you know, for people that are not in professional sports, and that's most of us uh, on this call today, it might seem strange to, to, to look at that. After all, what do the Boston Bruins, the hockey team, have to do with your organization's sales department and their effectiveness? But as researchers, we're interested in looking at findings across a range of contexts, whether that's uh, global organizations, different lines of business, sales, manufacturing, engineering, et cetera. And if it's those findings that provide really powerful lessons and is the reason why we started going uh, into the world of sports. And we think it's really applicable to leaders uh, across sectors. Uh, the other benefit of uh, using sports data, which Andy talks a lot about, is you can study teams over long periods of time. And there's consistency across teams and leagues because they have similar rules. And there mm -hmm. are objective measures of performance. And a lot of those data are uh, accessible. They can be scraped and put together in large databases. And that's what Andy and team did. So to sum it up, sports provides a really rigorous setting to look at team effectiveness and to uh, identify recommendations from those data and lessons that could be used for leaders in all sectors of the economy. That's great, Dave. I appreciate that context. I see that some of you are dropping in your uh, sports allegiances in the chat, and I have to call out one of them. Somebody said AFC Richmond. For those of you who are familiar, that is a reference to the TV show Ted Lasso. And I just have to, you know, this is unprompted, and I, I, I didn't plant that, uh, that comment, but I just have to say we're going to be live again next week uh, for a discussion specifically about purpose-driven leadership lessons from the show Ted Lasso. So whoever made that comment or for the other Ted Lasso fans out there, uh, tune in next week. There's there'll be information in our feed. Uh, there already is some information in our feed about that, but we'll be sharing more. It, it is uh, next Thursday. So hope to see you in particular on any Ted Lasso fans there. Um, Andy, let's test your audio really quickly. How are you doing? Unfortunately, still the same. So um, this is gonna. This will be a recurring bit. We'll just keep bringing Andy back, testing him out, and um, you all can maybe place bets in the background. I know you know betting is a, a greater part of the sporting world uh, these days, um, and maybe you can place bets on whether Andy's audio will work the next time. Um, Andy, don't don't worry about it. We're just gonna keep testing it out and keep rolling as we go. Um, Dave, you touched on this in, in in terms of like why do this research in the first place, but I'm curious for you personally, like what was your interest in being part of this research piece? And uh, you obviously are very busy given your role here at the center, but what drew you into this? Yeah, I would say, um, and thinking back about that, since I've been a child, I was a child, I've always participated in both individual and team sports. And given the leadership roles I've had at CCL and the many client teams, mostly senior teams that I've worked with across the globe, um, there were intersections between my own experience being on teams at work and in sports and the research on team effectiveness that Andy um, and colleagues put together. So when I uh, learned from Andy that he had 
put together a really interesting blog on the World Cup soccer and its connection to team development. Um, I reached out to him to talk about what we might do to extend his research on soccer to other sports. And hockey was the obvious target, given that when he and I spoke, it was just before the Stanley Cup. And it was also a couple months after Martin joined CCL, and we knew Martin had been a player and coach for a lot of years. So those two um, interests collided, and here we are today. Well, I love just it. That, yeah, I, I was interested in the Stanley Cup and hockey because I was trying to figure out what the soccer and World Cup thing really was all about. And I said, well, you might as well look at uh, the sport that I know about. And I appreciate that they did. Yeah, that, that that's perfect. I, I love the the idea of building on the research from from one initial piece that Andy worked on and then drawing lessons for other sports and, and trying to look at this more holistically. One of the things, uh, for those of you who haven't read it, which is probably all of you, um, you can find the link to this research in the description for this event. Um, so you, you can dive more into that later, but we, we'll talk through the high points for you here. So don't scurry and go read that just yet. But um, one of the things that the research talks about that I think is really compelling is this idea that great teams aren't built they're developed, uh, which can be applied to leaders, to leadership sphere, really, in, in any sector uh, across any geography. But in the sports world, specifically the NHL, uh, many people may think that, you know, more money spent on players um, or getting players of a certain caliber or athletes of a certain caliber, that that's really going to determine the success of the team, the number of wins. Um, but what our research shows is that's not the case and that developing players is really what makes a difference. So I'm going to test Andy's audio again. Andy, uh, if you were able to hear that question, you know, what is it um, about building a team that, that we saw in, in the data? Uh, we still can't hear you, Andy. I'm sorry. Um, Dave, I'm going to throw this question to you um, since you're the, you know, most most closely associated with Andy on the team. Andy's going to jump back out and try and jump okay. jump in again and join us. Um, but t let's talk a little bit about this idea. Great teams uh, aren't built, they're developed. OK, sure. And so, again, I'm channeling Andy and uh, some of the work he did uh, with some colleagues. So part of the study that we wanted to share with you today is Andy uh, scraped data from 32 NHL National Hockey League teams across several seasons. And what he found was that the average amount of money the teams spend on player salaries per game is a weak predictor of the team's likelihood of success. So said again, the amount that teams spend on player salaries is not a good predictor of the team's success. In fact, a team could nearly double the salaries that it's spent on players and only expect to see a 3% absolute increase in winning percentage. Double uh, salary spent, 3% increase. So for example, make it concrete. If a team spends $2.5 million per game on their players, and that's an average amount in the NHL, 2.5 million per game, the predicted likelihood of their winning the game is 51%. So a little bit above half. A team that spends $4.5 million per game, that's $2 million more per game, can expect a win percentage of, drum roll, 54%. So 2.5 million, 51% win rate, 4.5, 54%. So it's really refreshing because it means that a team can't simply buy a Stanley Cup trophy. And it's an important lesson for all of us that, suggests that there are many other things teams need to consider to be effective. And just, you know, for those of you that are Messi fans and you're watching Inter Miami and, you know, they were a pretty lousy team and then Messi came. Messi's play, um, paid a lot of money, but what he did in conjunction with the rest of that team is they all elevated their game and now they're winning like crazy. So that's, you know, a really current example of the interplay between individuals and team effectiveness. And just to kind of extend this into Major League Baseball, while we yeah. haven't done 
research. Is that okay, Eric, that we go there? Please. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't yet done work on Major League Baseball, but here's some basic data to support Andy's research. So if we look at this year, 2023, the two highest payrolls of Major League teams are the New York Mets, and they spend $346 million during the baseball season on their payroll, $346 million, and the Yankees, New York Yankees, $279 million. The Yankees are in last place in the American League East. And the Mets are one game out of last place. And the Mets have the fifth lowest win percentage of 20 National League teams. Now, contrast that with the Baltimore Orioles. They're in first place. And their payroll is $71 million, which is the third lowest payroll of all Major League Baseball teams. So we have the, Yankee, the Mets at $346 million, the Yankees at $279 million. And they're doing lousy, and the Orioles have a $71 million payroll, and they're in first place. And the Mets just got rid of their one of their best or most highly compensated players because pitchers because it wasn't working. So I think for, for those of you who are not interested in sports, right, it can be easy maybe when you hear the, the name of a team or players to sort of go glassy-eyed and, and miss the heart of what Dave's saying. So I just want to underscore some of the points that he's making is that while we haven't studied hockey, or sorry, we haven't studied Major League Baseball, we do see a through line in the same takeaway that we're getting from hockey from the World Cup that you can't necessarily buy your way to a championship, that money alone is not going to get you there. And I'm just going to come back to something, Dave, that you said earlier, because I, 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 I think you said it twice, but I think it needs to be said three times, that, that you, the research found, <clears throat> our research found that we, you could only get a 3% absolute increase in winning percentage by almost doubling what you were spending on salaries. Did I get that right? Yeah. So, so I mean, that that is a very small percentage for a whole lot of money. Um, <clears throat> Martin, I would love to bring you in on this and, and also just want to quickly um, see if we can, can uh, test uh, Andy in a moment. But first, I want to ask you... Um, you know, what does this tell you about the what it means, what how top talent factors into this discussion and, and, and what is your reaction to, to what Dave is sharing about not being able to buy yourself uh, to a trophy? Well, if you could buy yourself to a trophy, we would all do that, wouldn't we? Um, so it's not just about the cost to acquire the talent. Um, many of you have watched or played hockey, and if you haven't, um, you would know that it's a physically demanding sport. An NHL team typically practices a few times a week, plus they play three to four games a week. Um, and that's over a seven month regular season. And I'll tell you that players are bigger, stronger and faster, much bigger, stronger and faster than when I played. And I'll also tell you that um, you feel it when you get hit, hit by a player skating 20 to 30 miles an hour someone who is 6'2", 230 pounds, it hurts. And it hurts when you get hit by a puck traveling at 90 miles an hour. And the point is that injuries happen. And players are traded midseason. Sometimes players have an off day. It happens to all of us. Uh, and players, along with team chemistry and the team culture, also impact winning. So it's not just about the cost of acquiring talent. That's such an important point uh, for all of us to keep in mind. Uh, I want to, my next question is going to be for you again, Martin, but I want to try and bring Andy back, who's trying so diligently uh, to, to, to rejoin and, and work out his audio. Andy, it's not your fault. Kudos to you for, for keeping trying. Can you hear me and can we hear you? Hey, Eric, is this working any better? Oh, here he is. Uh, yes, amazing. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. So I'm sorry that the next question is not for you, but. I want to follow up on what Martin was just saying, but we'll come back to you in just a minute, Andy. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, all right. So, so Martin, you were just talking about, you know, injuries happen and, and obviously we know there are different um, team team dynamics at play here. We've talked about a few different sports. I mentioned earlier that basketball is my sport. So I'm going to make a comparison for those of you who are into basketball, follow the NBA, you know, that my Boston Celtics, uh, should have, uh, by all accounts, made it 
at least to the finals and, and maybe won the whole thing. But when we were playing against the Miami Heat, you heard the commentators say over and over and over again that four of Miami's star players were undrafted, meaning that people bet against them and thought that they weren't good enough and they are not the kind of people that would have commanded that sort of payroll uh, <clears throat> that you would see from the stars. But instead, through development, through working with their people, through building a team, they were able to build a championship level team and make it to the NBA finals. So uh, there are really parallels across different sports. Um, obviously, as uh, an employee in the organization where Martin is a CEO, I'm not trying to give him the idea that uh, compensation doesn't matter at all. Uh, I'd get in trouble with my colleagues if I if I made that suggestion. So don't don't get the wrong idea here, Martin. But obviously, there's there's more at work here. Uh, and and Dave was sharing more about the research that the three of you did, um, and that Andy obviously played played a huge role in. But um, is there anything that you would add? Uh, I know you spoke to this a little bit, but anything that you would add about why that leadership development is so important and what the what the takeaway is here for, for leaders at any sort of industry? Well, I did note that you said compensation isn't important for you, so I'll uh, note it. <laughs> I really appreciate that. No, uh, but uh, not joking. Uh, compensation, it's an important factor, but it's not the only one, and we know that. So having a team that really is truly aligned with the mission and understanding the role that everyone plays is critically important. And you go back to CSL's mission of developing leadership for the benefit of society worldwide. That's what drew me out of retirement. Um, it was the ability and the opportunity to make a difference, the opportunity to work with an organization that's committed to make this world a better place. So we each have different motivations. And for some, it's about the mission of the organization uh, or the team. For some, it's because of the love of the team. For some, it's the opportunity for growth. And others, it's the work environment or the culture. And for many also others, it's, uh, it's about the leader they work for. And the same goes true from what I've seen with athletes. Um, I've worked with players who've taken a pay cut to play on a different team because of the coach, because of the team culture, and because they believe that they can truly make a difference and making a difference really matters. I, I love that point, Martin. And I'm curious for those of you who are tuning in, you know, have you ever considered taking a pay cut uh, to, to work at an organization that better aligned with your, with your values or your long-term goals? You know, that, that I'm, I would love to hear from what about what Martin is saying resonates with you personally. Uh, I know that a lot of people in the nonprofit sphere will probably tell you that it's it's the mission more than anything that drives uh, their participation in their organization. Obviously, there are a whole number of industries where people are not uh, primarily motivated by by salary or by financial gain. Um, so, so we we do see that in a number of places. Um, Andy, I'm going to come to you. It's it's your time to shine. Um, one of the things that this connects to really strongly is CCL's team effectiveness framework. And um, I just want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about that, what that, what the tie-in is to this uh, subject that we're discussing here, and, and maybe talk a little bit about the, the components that are within it. Yeah, thanks, Eric. So in CCL's team effectiveness framework, which really is what under was the underlying force be much of this interest in sports research in particular, we started seeing connections between this framework and what you see in the world of sports. So much of what we've been talking about now would fall within just one of those buckets, this core bucket where we're talking about the people, practices, and purpose of any given team. It matters. It's important. It's a huge dimension of team effectiveness. But there are three other dimensions as well. And this goes to this idea that simply investing in people it's a good place to start that is bringing in the right talent, having them in the team, ensuring people are aligned around practices and the team's purpose. But there's other pieces of this puzzle that need to be there as well. So collective mindset, you know, I was trying to think of relationships to the sports world. I often think of this as this idea that if you're on the ice, if you're on the basketball court, if you're on the pitch and you close your eyes, do you know where the other team members are going to be at any given moment? And that can show up in the world of business and organizations as well. Does everybody have a pretty good sense of, what they should be doing at any time, and how that relates to other members of the team. Cohesive relationships, you know, if you're staying inside of that sports metaphor, that sports context, this would be what you often talk about is that locker room mentality, that feeling of the relationships that exist 
on and off the field or on and off the ice? Do people trust each other? Is there psychological safety? Is there cohesion? Do people actually really like being around each other in the team? Another important aspect of any team's effectiveness. And then lastly, is this idea where you're talking about do teams as an individual team, how do they connect to other teams in the organization? So almost like teams of teams. And what's interesting is you're seeing more of this in the sports landscape. So I'm an avid soccer fan. That's why I wrote a blog on the World Cup. What you're actually seeing now is multiple professional football clubs start to link up and create these pipelines of talent across multiple organizations, multiple teams. And that's happening inside of today's companies as well. In CCL, for example, we get a lot of work done, some really effective, incredible uh, tasks and achievements, not just from one team, but from multiple teams coming together and finding those connections and through boundary span. I, I love that. That's a uh, really great point to, to illustrate there. Um, and I'm, I'm curious from our audience, you know, what would you add about how these components come together on the teams that you are a part of in your organization or that you've led uh, in the past, maybe? Uh, one portion of the, the, the research that you all did that I think really speaks to the importance of teams and leaders recognizing that you know, behind every goal or basket score that there are individual people uh, that are members of those teams working together to support the overall success of the team. And I think you you just spoke to that beautifully. Um, Andy, before we move on, I want to just give you a chance to, to circle back. Are there things that, you know, I, I don't know how much you were able to stay tuned into what we were discussing versus sort out your technical issues, but are there are there things that we were discussing earlier, points that you would want to add to uh, or would you like to just sort of roll forward? You know, from what I heard, I honestly, it's of teamwork. I'll give a big tip of the hat to Dave and Martin for kind of covering what I was hoping to discuss. So I think we're in good place in terms of what I was going to try to share. I think they did a really great job of, you know, supporting and kind of uh, helping stand me up while I was trying to get here to join you all. Perfect. Well, so we didn't do this intentionally as a way to illustrate that Dave would know where Andy was going to be if he closed his eyes. But I think we we can see that that's exactly what just happened here. Um, Martin, I want to come to you. You know, you mentioned the other day uh, as we were sort of uh, kicking around the idea for this conversation, you mentioned that a lot of the players who come to you, regardless of, you know, their level uh, or, or age, that they're often not always, but often some of the best players, uh, because those are the people that are really looking to improve their game. Um, and I thought that was an interesting point. I just want to give you the opportunity to elaborate on how you see that crossing over into the, the larger business world. Well, again, the, the analogies between business and, and sport are great. And what we know in sport that and, and business that top players, top talent are always looking to improve and that their coaches or managers understand the importance of that as well. Um, you know, in hockey and sports, the coaches have to allow time for players to work on their individual game or talent in addition to the team play. And players come to me because they want to hone their skills and they see small adjustments, these continuous improvements, like more knee bend to drive power or, or turning your shoulder a certain way around turns can really have a great impact. And again, it's the same, um, in business, continuous development. But i also say that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that the game of hockey has evolved over the years and it's it's still about scoring more goals than your opponent, but there's much more flow than when I played. Um, I'll say maybe players are smarter, they're faster, they're, they're stronger, more skilled. And I know that if I taught players the way that I was taught, they wouldn't be successful in today's game. Today, teaching skills and coaching is evidence-based, and we use research, analytics, and technology. And the same holds true for leadership development. Today's leaders must be able to synthesize much, much more input from much more diverse sources around the globe at a much faster pace than ever before. So the game of business is, is getting faster, and it's always going to continue to evolve. And that's why focusing on individual talent skills and team is critically important. Yeah, just I want to um, pull out two things that you said there that I, I mean, it was all compelling, but two that really stood out to me in particular, talking about um, people who are always looking to improve. You know, if you are tuned into this conversation, I think all of you fall into that category. I would consider this an extracurricular 
uh, attempt at self-improvement. So kudos to you for, for being here and enjoying joining us for this conversation. Um, and then also, um, you know, I, I've lost the, the second part of my point. I got really excited about all of you being uh, overachievers <laughs> in the audience. Um, but I'm just going to move on to the, the next section section here, Andy, going back to you, um, you know, one of the things that the research talked on is the the too much talent effect. And uh, I could paraphrase it, but I, you know, I'd rather just let you speak to what, what do we mean when we say too much talent effect and, and what did your, your research show? Yeah, thanks, Eric. So this is actually an effect that's been shown in uh, multiple different studies. I think, um, you know, Swab et al. or some researchers in 2014 who might have coined the term, but we've tried to build upon that by looking at it in some additional sports settings. And really what the too much talent effect is this idea that it's kind of counterintuitive, that if you add more and more star players, really talented individuals to a team, not only might you see diminishing returns on that talent, so they're not winning as much as you might expect, but you actually might see kind of downturns where they're actually winning less than kind of average talented teams. And so where this has been full on display in our own data that we've been analyzing is from the 2018 World Cup. So for those of you who are familiar with um, soccer and football, Brazil as a national team is one of the most star studded teams every four years at this tournament. In fact, in 2018, their entire starting roster would be considered stars by the cutoffs that we were using. So they were in the top 10% of talent worldwide. And you compare that to other teams that happen to be in the tournament. So Saudi Arabia, for example, had no players that met that threshold that would be considered stars. Now, given that disparity, we would expect Brazil to win, if not be in the finals every four years in the World Cup tournament. But if you've watched 2018, and if you watched the 2022 tournament most recently, they didn't really progress terribly far in the World Cup tournament. And that suggests then that there might be something else going on and it's kind of a, this kind of challenge for leaders, right? Most managers, most leaders won't turn away top talent. They love to have as much talent in their team as possible, but the too much talent effect suggests that putting all of those stars in a single team might actually lead to a downturn in the team's performance. So what we've actually been kind of wrestling with kind of going forward almost as a sneak preview is, well, one recommendation that exists is you take these different stars and you put them in separate teams. So some of this research has been done in, for example, sales teams, financial analysts, and the idea is that they all have their own space to shine. That might work. That might work in your organization. That might work in your company. But we also know that not every leader has as much control over their, their team's composition, who's in their team, who's not. And so we're actually trying to find ways to which inside of a single team, if you have multiple highly talented individuals, is there a way to share resources, share time, and try to find a way in which all of the stars in a single team can shine and thrive and help really push that team into a highly effective, really exceptional, overall performing team? Yeah, this wasn't planned, but it does make me think of the uh, 1992 USA Dream Team. Again, I'm going to keep bringing in basketball, but highly, highly skilled team of, of superstars. Um and, and so just just want to throw throw that out there. Uh, Andy, looks like you want to react to that. Well, what's funny, Eric, is your 100 percent is the um, swab at all. And then those researchers, they actually started in basketball. And in their manuscript, they cited that team as like a quintessential example of an all star team that should have walked to the gold medal. And they didn't. And now there's multiple documentaries that exist of why not? How could a team with so much talent not win? And it's, it's another really good example from the world of sports that we know also kind of generalizes to the world of business. Yeah, um, Dave, I, I feel like you uh, you want to jump in here. Is there anything that, that you would add to, to what Andy's saying? Yeah, I think those are really great uh, comments. And I would ask people, encourage people to think about teams that they've been on or that they're on now in the organizations that you're working for. And, and I've worked for some amazing organizations throughout my career and mostly amazing, highly functional teams. But I've been on some teams that certainly didn't lack for talent, but were not that effective. And uh, so, th so getting team effectiveness, and, and I refer back to the uh, team effectiveness framework that Andy talked about, I encourage you to download some of that work from uh, our website, but um, it's not just about getting that next great member of the team, recruiting somebody and paying them a higher salary because they're a superstar. To have an effective team, in an organization, you need to think about more than just individual capabilities and think more about the collective 
impact that individual team members have. Yeah, thank you for adding that, Dave. I, you know, when we're talking about sports, I automatically think of coaching and the importance that coaching plays in sports, every sport. Um, but obviously, coaching is part of other industries as well. Uh, you know, something that we can certainly speak to. Uh, and obviously, a great coach can be, you know, critical, if not, you know, mandatory for a team's success in the sports world. You know, Martin, as someone who has coached athletes at a range of levels, um, including professionals, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about how coaching leadership, coaching teams um, can help and develop, transform an organization? Um, I, I would just love to he hear your insights on the topic. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll come back to the talent theme as well. So if I'll refer you to the 1980 USA Olympic hockey team, the miracle team as they referred to. Um, no stars on the team, and yet a great coach took that team and built a winning culture, developed a system based on the strengths of all the players, not just the stars, because there really weren't any, and made adjustments throughout the season and during the games where it mattered most. So in this case, Herb Brooks um, and Oakham motivated their players. He mo motivated the players. He removed the distractions and he was able to get the best out of them. Additionally, great coaches continually assess and develop the team and the team members. So everyone plays a role and they know the importance of their role on the team. And it could be the team captain to the back of goalie, the skills coach, the equipment manager, the fitness trainer, et cetera. But the coach is responsible for the direction, alignment and commitment of the team so um, I live in North Carolina now. Um, I follow the work with the, the Hurricanes. And when Rod Brindamore came in a few years ago, probably five, six years ago now, to become the head coach of the Hurricanes, he said that one of the first things he needed to do was to change the culture in the locker room. Earn it was his mantra. So he built a foundation on caring, competing, and committing. Winning became a belief, not a hope. So it was all about direction, alignment, and commitment. The coach is absolutely critical. The leader of the team, absolutely critical. I, I love that you brought in direction, alignment, commitment. For those of you who are familiar with the Center for Creative Leadership, you probably heard that framework of ours uh, before. Uh, and you can find more information about it on our website, certainly. Um, Martin, that's a, a great example of when coaching works. Um, you mentioned before we got started uh, about, you know, how you've seen uh, coaching, you know, when, when you don't, what happens when you don't have an effective coach. Um, so just, you know, would love to hear more from you uh, on that example as well. Yeah. And, um, and again, you could replace the word coach in this example with leader, manager, and I'll also say I'm not sure it's an inspiring story, but it really gets to the heart about what we're talking about. So I was friends with a coach who took over a very successful team and he brought in new players, his guys, um, and ignored the core group of players, the team that uh, were the leaders in the previous years. And his guys got more playing time, although the core group scored more goals. He consistently praised his guys, his new guys, while berating the core team. And he wasn't prepared for games or practices. Some might say, I might say, he was a little bit lazy the way he showed up. And as important, he wasn't coachable. He wouldn't listen to others. He wouldn't listen to what people were providing him as, as really good input. And so you're thinking, based on this story, that the team didn't do well. But in reality, they did. Um, the core team held them together, but it was a toxic culture, toxic environment. And at the end of the season, although they did well, many of the top, the top players, even some of the ones that his, he brought in, asked to be traded. So teams and companies can be successful short term. Long term, this will have an impact on their ability to attract and retain talent. And I learned over the years that the team culture, the company culture is absolutely critical. It's how leaders show up is critical. And the leader must set, as you just said, we talked about the direction of 
and the culture assure the team is aligned and committed to help each other succeed. People know their roles. The team leader, the leader, the coach must be committed to the mission and to the team. I think I think it's important to look at, you know, both sides of this point. So I appreciate you sharing, you know, stories of, of it working and what happens when it doesn't. Um, and, and also, I, I like that your example there is not, you know, black and white. You know, they, they, there was some short term success, uh, but ultimately that that uh, sounds like it proved to be disastrous for the organization. If you have a lot of your the people, even the, the people that this coach brought in, you know, asking for a trade. So um, lots of lessons to be learned there in, in, in any organization. We're going to transition in a moment to questions from the audience. If you haven't asked them yet, so there's still time, please drop those in the chat. We'll do our best to answer each of those. Um, but while we're waiting for those questions to roll in, you know, I'm, I'm curious, Dave, Martin, and especially you, Andy, since you were um, cut a little short, unfortunately, were there things that you would like to, you know, that stood out to you in particular from this research um, that we you didn't have a chance to touch on or that you want to really emphasize that like one insight or takeaway that you hope people have. Well, Andy, I'm going to start with you. Yeah. I, so I think that actually I might double click on what Martin said a little bit where he, he was talking about this kind of trade-off between short-term performance versus long-term gains. And there's actually, that's an intentional reason why in the CCLT effectiveness framework, we talk about effectiveness as opposed to performance because effectiveness actually encompasses both this idea of like short-term performance, meeting your team's objectives, but also the long-term viability, the long-term success of a team. And just to kind of bring that into the sports world, many of us can think of examples of a team that maybe one year raced to a championship and then the next year completely disintegrated, couldn't even make it back to the playoffs. Maybe we were just back in kind of the lower tiers or lower standings of their league. And I think that goes to Martin's point of if you're going to have an effective team, there's a lot that goes into effectiveness over the long run. We can see it in sports and we can see it in organizations. So I'd like to just kind of double click on that idea and and kind of highlight the fact that we really kind of believe in that in the CCL team effectiveness framework intentionally and, and try to highlight that there. Just like before, when I thought of the, you know, the NBA dream team, uh, examples are coming to mind. I'm sure that's happening for those of you watching. If there are, you know, specific uh, scenarios that you want to call out in the chat, please feel free to do that. Um, Dave, I'm going to come to you. Any any uh, thing that's resonating most with you or, or things that you would want to make sure to speak to from this research? Yeah, one thing I would suggest, which I've started doing recently, is take the components of the team effectiveness framework, uh, collective mindset, connection, core, and cohesive relationships. Have that in front of you or embedded in your mind. And then look at photographs, up there it is, of your team. And look at them first as individual team members through the lens here, and then look at them as a collective, all of them together, if you can fit them on one screen. And think about to what extent are we functioning with a collective mindset? To what extent are we working across our own team, but also other parts of the organization, et cetera? And I think for me, that's helpful to um, assess how we're doing as a collective. With, while still paying attention to individual achievement. That's great. Martin, uh, what would you add or what do you think is important to-, to well, I'm, I, Yeah, um, no, those are great points. I'm gonna slant a little bit because we've been talking primarily about leadership, um, primarily about team effectiveness. Um, and the team examples that we used are um, male teams, men's teams. Um, so I've worked with more female hockey players. Um, and when you take a look at it, um, you know, the success is uh, exactly what we're talking about here. Um, you know, coaching skills, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at what just happened in the, the World Cup, the amount of talent on the U.S. Um, World Cup team, women's World Cup team was, was immense. But yet um, their success and I'm not going to analyze why uh, they didn't achieve it. Um, so again, all of our examples have been about uh, um, men's teams. Same holds true for women's. Um, and I've coached many, many girls and women's throughout my career. And what I also say with hockey, again, bringing it back, um, running learn to play programs. I love the fact that, um, you know, from a demographic girls in sports 
especially hockey is uh, the number one. I mean, it's growing tremendously. So that, that's a great point. I appreciate you bringing it up, Martin. I, you know, I was thinking about the uh, the U.S. women's national team. Uh, that was uh, I, I was certainly pulling for them uh, and hoping hoping to see them go farther. But you know, having not done uh, a full breakdown of the research, but just as a fan watching. I definitely see the through lines here uh, uh, to, to that as well. So one question that we got in the chat for you all, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, but uh, someone wants to know if there's any way to analyze or look at um, time that team teams may be spent off the field or or uh, ice or, or you know, whatever the, 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 the pitch is, um, focus on team development or some sort of leadership development activity. Do we have any way... To, to gauge to what extent different teams uh, are engaging in that level uh, of development. Uh, Andy, I'm going to go to you since uh, you haven't had a chance to speak as much. Yeah, sure. I mean, I might take this from a research question, from a research perspective, but I certainly would be curious to hear Martin and Dave's perspective from their own experiences. But what's interesting, to me, I hear this question, it sounds a little bit like, do we have evidence to suggest that if we're engaging in team development, maybe even leadership development in a team. And that's kind of somewhat distinct from the skill building, the task focused development that you often do on a field or on the rink. And I would say absolutely, you know, a lot of the kind of foundational research done on team cohesion. So that's really kind of the interpersonal relationships among teams comes from sports psychologists and sports researchers. And they find that above and beyond the talent that's in the team, those relationships, which often form again, in the locker room, on the travels, maybe in some of these kind of more socially oriented events, it can add to the actual kind of performance of the team on the pitch or on the ice. So I would say, yeah, there's definitely evidence of that, but, you know, curious to hear if, if Dave and Martin as well might have some other ideas to share. Yeah. My experience is um, uh, that all of us are better than any one of us. So if we can, intervene and work with all of us. And this is around culture and what Andy was just talking about, team cohesiveness and relationships. Individual performance will elevate and collective performance will elevate even more. So individuals are important, obviously, but to the extent that we can truly function as a team, easier said than done, then we will get more uh, accomplished and have a more meaningful experience working uh, in groups. And I'll just add that um, <clears throat> to the points made that a team that plays together, they know each other really well. And you can't do that just on the pitch or on the ice or in an office. You have to get to know the individual. And it's really important for a coach and it's really important for a manager. You have to know your team. Part of that is uh, developing trust for each other. Part of it is about uh, understanding strengths and weaknesses. So I think the uh, we'll call it the off ice or off, uh, you know, off work time is critically important to build that team culture, team com com camaraderie, et cetera. But um, truly important to know the team. Great point. So we have another question here that I'm just going to read out and then I'm going to add to a little bit. So the question is. Uh, there's so much rich objective data available to players and coaches in sports. Think about instant replays. Um, we have much later replays in business coaching and uh, only in some cases, if we go to that moment in a meeting or discussion, what tech can help us see our clients in action in business? And I'm just going to add to that, you know, what, what role uh, can tech play? And before I give it to any of you to answer, just, you know, another thing that this question makes me think of is the need for for more instant feedback so if one of you in your response can mention sbi or some other uh, more of uh, feedback that's you know not in a, a, a quarterly or annual performance review i think that would be be helpful as well um but anyone want to raise their hand and, and dive in on this question about what role uh tech can play in uh or or solutions uh to to, to sort of like bring that element from the sports world into the business world do you see an opportunity there yeah, I'd like to at least take a first jump at that, Eric. So we're actually currently collaborating, again, thinking of like connections across multiple teams. There's kind of teams of teams inside of CCL who are exploring ways in which 
and the analogy that I use is we're moving beyond kind of survey self-report kind of rating skills. Those are fantastic. I often kind of equate that with like the box score of the overall match, how maybe the team did uh, as an as an entity throughout an entire kind of period, like these quarterly um, financial reports or summary reports. What we're looking at now is, is there a way in which you can give leaders as well as their teams behavioral feedback that's almost moment by moment that allows them, much like to this question's point, sports teams and other types of uh, organizations try to provide to their own team members. So really kind of looking at the video break breakdown and that moment by mo moment by moment feedback. And just to go to your point, Eric, that type of feedback can be incredibly useful in inside of what CCL calls this situation behavior impact feed, uh, framework, so SBI. So if I know how my behaviors show up in certain situations and that then impacts either my team or individuals outside of my team, that can be really useful. And so we're exploring that. There's a lot of really interesting upside around that and hopefully more to come in the not too distant future. Yeah, I said, Andy noted, yeah. the tech is increasingly there. So we can measure at a pretty precise level, moment by moment, different ways that people interact. The research supporting that um, with real teams in real time, that's what we're focused on right now. Again, we mentioned it earlier about uh, the use of data analytics and even things like social media where you can reach out and you know get immediate feedback from your colleagues. Um, I say social, but uh, networking, et cetera, because, um, you know, as we know, coaching is a gift and, and being able to receive that uh, near instant feedback is truly important. The feedback in the moment. That's great. So we only have time for one more question. I want to squeeze it in. This sort of relates to the too much talent effect, I think, in a way, but really ties into what we're discussing more broadly. But how do you ensure that your teams are well-rounded and that each member's skills are used in the right place or way? Uh, you know, I think in some ways that's the, the million dollar question here, right? But uh, does anyone want to take a stab at it? Yeah, I mean, well, you, so yeah. one view is, you know, there's a lot of attention on diversity, uh, equity and inclusion. So diversity, there's plenty of research uh, showing that diversity of all different types is really important. But diversity in the absence of inclusion and equity falls short. So I think what um, leaders need to, to do is take an expansive view of, of their teams, the composition of their teams, the lived experiences that people have, and bring them together in an inclusive way, accounting for the um, equity needs that, that people have. And in so doing, you increase the odds that the team will be uh, more effective. Yeah, and That's great. Jump in, Martin. Yeah. So, you know, coming back to hockey, so growing up, the game has changed. And, you know, similar to business, we were always told, stay in your lane. You know, if you play defense, you play defense. If you were an IT person, you, you stuck to IT. Um, back to where Dave was uh, going, also the inclusion of diverse thoughts. So um, someone in IT has extremely valid points around business, business around technology. So it really is leveraging the skills of each and not staying in your lane. I encourage people not to stay in a lane and providing the, the feedback. Because again, we all have strengths and, and weaknesses and we all want to continue to grow and you grow by learning more and you le learn by uh, being exposed to the different experiences and working with your different colleagues. Or, um, so, uh, you know, it really is about um, stepping outside your lane. I love that, Martin. Andy, anything you'd like to add there? Yeah, I, I might just, you know, I think those are all fantastic points. I might just add that, you know, part of what, I think when we look at the skills team effectiveness framework that rings true to me is that this idea of too much talent and not really understanding how the pieces fit together and get the most out of your team. That's how that entire framework, you know, we kind of say informally that if you're firing in all cylinders on those four things, there's a really good chance that your team will be effective. And so if you're feeling like you're not getting the most out of your team members or there's some type of kind of misalignment between the talents you have and what you were expecting to achieve, that kind of framework or stepping back and thinking holistically, like Dave's saying, maybe from an EDI perspective or Martin saying from kind of uh, leveraging the different knowledge or expertise and not kind of pigeonholing people into certain backgrounds. I think thinking kind of holistically about your team, maybe from that framework's perspective or just more broadly in general, 
can help uh, rectify what might be this this too much talent effect and how it's showing up in your own team. Yeah, I, I love that, Andy. And it makes me think, too, we should uh, mention that we are going to share the, the link uh, to learn more about the team effectiveness framework uh, in the chat for this so you can click and, and learn more. Obviously, we've been sharing the framework on the screen, but want to give you the opportunity to, to dive a little deeper if you would like. Uh, and, and related in the description for this event, you can uh, find the link to, to read some of the research uh, that we've been discussing today directly for yourself. If, you, if you'd like to go in more detail. So unfortunately, that's all that we have time for today. Um, but uh, I want to thank all of you for tuning in. Really grateful for you to be uh, being here, sticking with us through a little bit of a technical difficulty at the beginning. This has been a really rich conversation. I see uh, in, the, in the comments that we've gotten a lot of questions. Unfortunately, there were several that we didn't have time to get to, but uh, people really appreciated everything that the three of you shared today. So just want to Thank the three of you for, for sharing your insights uh, and expertise with us uh, today. And um, uh, for all of you who have uh, tuned in, you know, I, I know we mentioned this earlier, but we, we are going to be going live. Wherever you're watching this, you can find our next live conversation about Ted Lasso and Purposeful Leadership. It's going to be next Thursday, which is August 24th. At, and that will be at noon Eastern time. Um, so I encourage you to sort of continue the discussion with us there. Uh, before you go, please share this conversation with your network so uh, we can amplify these, these great insights. Again, thank you all for tuning in. And, and Dave, Andy, Martin, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Bye, everybody.